All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are back with Imam Isa Woods. Uh, inshallah, he has some very interesting things to share with us. Um, I know that uh, the last few videos he's been with us, people really appreciated him coming uh, and sharing his thoughts um, and ideas. And uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, there was such a demand on the videos we did with the, the genes and the animals and stuff that uh, I kind of like, used a part of that in even in my Urdu video because everyone was so interested in genetically modified uh, foods and, and living the natural way. So um, today we want to talk about things that revolve around da'wah and, uh, and, um, and some of the other issues that relate to that in terms of uh, people that come to Islam with uh, a background that's maybe difficult or like they might be transgender or they might, they might be um, bisexual and then they come to Islam and, and then they're living normal lives after that. They come back to fitrah. And so um, the experience of da'wah is such, it really shows you um, the power of Islam. And one of the things that I really recommend every parent doing is that, you know, every child in, in the West has to grow up seeing people convert to Islam. It's very powerful. You, you have to see, you know, you got this whole world out there, but when you so, show a child, look, somebody's coming from that world to Islam, uh, I know that that had a big impact upon me as I was growing up, right? Uh, the people I looked up to in my teen years were people that were converts and had made that complete journey. Um, and so, uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'll give the floor to you, Imam Isa. So, um, I know that you have a few cases you want to talk about, uh, but uh, I also want to emphasize, and I know Imam Isa will be emphasizing this too, is the role Quran plays in da'wah. The role Quran plays in the sunnah of the Prophet and even today, that you know, if God can't convince you, no one can convince you. And so if a person picks up the Quran and begins to read it, there's a very, very high chance that they will uh, to really take Islam seriously and convert. And then, of course, one of the big problems that we face in the Muslim community is about 60% of the people that do accept Islam end up leaving. Um, and so Imam Isa wants to also talk about what keeps a person in Islam after they convert uh, or be, after they become Muslim or revert. Um, so Imam Isa, I'll give you the floor, inshallah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Jazakum Allahu khairan, Shaykh Amwar, for having me on again. Um, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, you're certainly an inspiration for me, um, and I consider you a teacher. Um, so may Allah accept me as, as your student. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people don't really know who I am. Um, I just kind of showed up on your channel one day. So let me give them a little background about myself. Um, obviously, I didn't grow up as a Muslim. Um, I grew up in a kind of nominally Protestant Christian home. Um, I did accept Christianity, I think, at the age of 10 at the uh, what they call Mountaintop Youth Camp, which is this uh, fire and brimstone evangelical Christian camp where they uh, interestingly enough, uh, my first introduction to a Dajjal was there, the Antichrist. They would, uh, we would play games all day, and then they would take us into a giant hall. We would sing songs, and then at night they would play these horror movies of like people being left behind when Jesus comes oh. to deal with the Antichrist, and you know it was it was all dispensationalism and uh, evangelical uh, Christian teaching, not Orthodox Christianity by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but, at, you know, at, the, at around the age of 13, I got into to the entertainment business, playing music. And religion took a backseat in my life for a long time. Um, I always had a relationship with God in the sense that I would pray to God. Um, I don't recall ever becoming an atheist, though I entertained the ideas at points in my life due to influences from friends. Because um, the entertainment business is not full of spiritual people. <laughs> this is Daru Shaitan. Um, but I had some friends die later on in life, um, in my early 20s. Uh, well, actually, late teens, early 20s. Uh, a best friend growing up uh, got drunk one night, hit a telephone pole, and expired. Uh, another one drowned in a swimming pool that I was playing in a band with. And, you know, I think tragedy 
a lot of times causes people to take a step back from this fast paced dunya and start thinking about why am I here? At that point, I started to get more interested in religion again. I would go back to church sporadically and have conversations with the pastor. And um, I think whenever I discovered that um, around 2005, or maybe it was late four or early five, that 9-11 was a controlled demolition and not as it was being told to us by the government, that's when my entire world changed. Um, because I think that that's one of those pivotal moments in your life where you take a step back and all of a sudden you're like, well, wait a second, if that's not true, what else is not true? Right. And I went down a really, you know, difficult rabbit hole of discovering what wasn't true. And you start realizing it's most things you've been told. And um, I won't get into all those things today because that's not what I want to talk about. But uh what strangely enough ended up happening is my Bible beaten Fox news watching evangelical Christian older brother came home one day and told my mom, he was Muslim. And, uh, you know, my family just, we're just Southerners, you know, the, you know, all we know about Islam is whatever the television tells us. We weren't encountering Muslims, uh, at least on a regular basis. Well, I was the only person in my family who would talk to him about it. I would sit down and ask him questions because I didn't know anything about Muslims. I had no opinion of them. And subhanAllah, he ended up giving me a Quran one day, a translation, and I still have it. I wish I had brought it with me today. I'd show you it's all beat up and old, but the, um, he gave it to me and I just kind of, I did what a lot of people do. I just kind of opened it up and thumbed through it. Just, you know, it's like I said, if I'm going to find a dollar on one of the pages or something, I always wonder why people do that with books. But um, so at, at a, a certain point in my life, the entertainment business was no longer appealing to me. And because I had invested so much of my life in that cause, I became immensely depressed thinking about, well, what am I going to do now with my life? Like what's going to give me meaning if it's not entertaining people? And I think my brother saw me one day, like really just sitting in my room doing nothing, just depressed as I could possibly be. And he said, look, man, I gave you a Quran. Why have you never opened it up and read it? And I said, you know, I don't know. He said, well, what are you afraid? You might know what it says. And he's appealing to my intellect here, which I think is something I really respect about the Quran is it appeals to the intellect of the reader. Mm -hmm. It's always asking you to think. And, you know, his argument was completely valid. Like, what am I afraid I might know what it says? So I just opened it up with no intention other than just to see what it says. Now, here's where a lot of people go wrong with the Quran. They go into the Quran with an intention. Like, I'm going to find what I'm looking for, you know, as opposed to like, what, is, you know, what does this have to say to me? You know, and I, I, I you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah guided me to have that intention uh, because immediately I gathered from reading the Quran that this book was actually for me. I mean, and, and I've, I've talked to many people who have the same experience that you feel like the author is talking to you hmm. directly and to no one else but you. And it's a very strange experience. Uh, it just goes right into your heart. And it's so heavy. You know, it's like, whoa, you know, I mean, you, some of the statements in the Quran are just like, you know, once you read them, it's very just the weight of the statement is just hard to deal with, you know. Anyway, long story short, um, that led me down a path to learn who is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I think that was the seal of the deal for me right there. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, why has this man never been mentioned in my history book? Not even a paragraph. I learned about Genghis Khan and Julius Caesar and all these people. But he doesn't, a man who influences one fifth of the world today and not even a paragraph. You know, this is pre 9-11 high school, by the way. Mm. I imagine he probably merits a chapter or two today, but. So um, I ended up becoming Muslim on March the 13th of 2009, so 11 years ago. Now, what happened to me immediately was that I was the, basically the only white American who came to the Islamic Center that I went to. And um, we, our, our community wasn't really doing any active dawah out to the non-Muslims, but non-Muslims would contact us. And they would say, hey, can we come tour your building? And it would be college students, churches, just, you know, Sunday school classes that study world religion. And suddenly I found myself being thrust into the forefront by the community members to go talk to these people. 
Mm. And so I had to learn very quickly how to introduce Islam to people, even though at the time I was probably quite ignorant of it, um, just knowing basic things. Um, so in a nutshell, after some time, I developed a program at our local community called Meet Your Muslim Neighbor. Mm. And what it was, was every single month, and we did this for, I think, I believe about six years straight, we would send out random invitations to college professors, government officials, churches, synagogues, you name it. I would just go on the internet and just take people's emails off of their websites and invite them to come to our building, do a tour, eat dinner with us. And then when they leave, they can take a free Quran and some brochures. Mm. Alhamdulillah, you know, it was very easy to do. We just did it consistently. Sometimes no one would show up. Sometimes 30 people would show up. But a lot of times people would actually request, well, we can't come the day you want it, but we'll do private tour if you can do one. And then hundreds of people would show up. It was very, very amazing. So thousands of people learned about Islam that way. And no one ever caused us a problem. No one, we never, I mean, it was always very easy. I didn't have to spend any money. Uh, A couple of local Somali sisters would cook food for the guests most of the time. Um, And I'll I'll just point out something here about uh, Dawah anyway, which is that, you know, it's really something we should be doing. You know, Allah didn't bring us to the Western world to um, live comfortable lives and go pray at the masjid five times a day. You know, like we're here to tell these people about this deen. Absolutely. And if we're not, if we're not the person who's doing it, you know, this is your language, your people, you understand them, you grew up here, you also understand the basics of Islam, you have to be a caller then. But if you can't be that person, then you should at least financially support the people who do. Mm -hmm. Because at the time when I was doing all this, I was very poor. I mean, I was, I recall times in my apartment where during the winter, I had no heat except Mm -hmm. in my room that I slept, you know, and I would just have a space heater in there because I couldn't afford to turn on the gas. And I, you know, um, you know, I would have brothers in the community. They would just walk up to me at these events and put a hundred dollars in my pocket. You know, I didn't ask, I didn't ask anybody for anything, but they would just do it. They would say, look here, you know, cause they knew that I was doing the job that they were supposed to be doing. But at the same time, they knew that, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't financially well off either. Um, and at the very least, if you can't even give something, please at least get up in the last third of the night for crying out loud and make dua for the people who are doing the work you should be doing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you can't be uh, excluded from one of these three groups. Everyone can do one of those things. SubhanAllah, um, you know, through this Meet Your Muslim Neighbor program, I didn't have thousands of people take shahada. I mean, that was not the case at all. I would say thousands of people were introduced to Islam. But I did have people take shahada. And um, I want to share a few of the people over the years that either I gave them shahada or I met them later on in life. And... The emphasis I want to put here today for everyone listening is the importance of, A, the fact that these people are out there and they're looking for something and we have something to give them and the role the Quran played in that. Now, I just told you that I became Muslim through reading a translation of the Quran. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, Allah guided me, but that was the asbab, the, the means through which, or the sebab, that was the means through which it happened. Um, I met a Muslim, I got a Quran, I learned about the prophet, I became Muslim. It was like a three-step process. Um, But uh, these are some of the people over the years. So I'm going to try right now to share my screen and just show you some of these people. And we can talk about their unique situation because some of them, like you said, have uh, stories that can be um, dealt with in more depth. So um, I'll just play you a quick uh, story. Now, this, this brother did not uh, accept Islam under my hands, uh, but I met him um, earlier on uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. By the way, you noticed your videos are showing up in my recommended, right? <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of God be upon you all. Today we have with us Brother Yusuf Niles. Nile. Nile, okay, I'm sorry. And we're just going to ask him a few questions. Uh, the first one being, Yusuf, you are new to the faith of Islam. You've been practicing it for going on a year now. 
a little over a year. A little over a year. What sparked your initial interest in the faith of Islam? Um, well, after 9-11, uh, I joined the military, and when I got out, I had learned that a lot of the things I had learned in the military weren't true, so I began to be more open-minded, and I started, I was seeking because I, I had a hole that Christianity wasn't filling, and that's what first sparked the interest to pick up the Quran and start to read it. Okay, now you are a recipient of Forkan Project, which mm -hmm. is the free distribution of the English translation of the Quran throughout the country. How did you get a copy? Um, I found a copy in the Dawah section of Al Farouk Islamic Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, when I when I first started asking questions, um, a brother led me to the Masjid for prayer. His name was. Zachariah Saeed, and you know, when I went to that section for free materials, I found the black and gold Quran. Now, what I want to point out here is that you know Yusuf has a very similar story of another um, brother that's very has a very famous YouTube uh, video, who was actually going to blow up a mosque one day. Now, not Yusuf, but the other brother I'm talking about. He was he was an ex-military guy, hated Muslims. He had, I, I'm pretty sure he had actually killed Muslims overseas in war, and. Uh, he ended up going to a masjid because his daughter had befriended a Muslim and he, he decided that maybe he should get to know Muslims and not just have blind hatred for them. And subhanAllah, they gave him a Quran and he began to read it and he would ask them questions. SubhanAllah, not only did he be, end up becoming Muslim, now he's the president of the Islamic Center. Hmm. But the point I'm trying to make here is here we have people who, and, and Yusuf is obviously implying here that 9-11 it was an inspiration behind him joining the military, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. You know, that these people were inspired by this event to go and, oh, well, we need to go fight these people. But lo and behold, they learn the truth when they actually go over there and see what's going on. And, you know, and then they go to a masjid and they meet Muslims and Muslims give them materials, right? So this is Yusuf Niles is a very common story, a very common story for, for a lot of people, ex-military. Um, and I go to um, occasionally uh, the local army base here in North Carolina to be a guest khatib for Jummah. And you meet these people, you know, who are even in the military actively right now, but have accepted Islam. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, it's important to note that here. Now, when we get into people that I actually um, were in, involved with uh, from the Meet Your Muslim Neighbor program, I'll just point out a few of them here. Now, this is Brother... Alec, and I don't have. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of God be upon you all today. We have with us Brother Al Reader. Peace be upon you, Al. And we're going to ask him a few questions. He's a recent uh, member of the Faith of Islam, just joined last week. And we just had three basic questions for him. So, Al, tell us what sparked your initial interest in the Faith of Islam. Um, after my dad died, I had some spiritual uh, searching and going through his old music, I found a Cat Stevens song, a couple of Cat Stevens songs, and I got interested, and one thing led to another. I looked at his Cat Stevens' life. His, na his name now is Yusuf Islam. Um, he was a convert to Islam as well, and that kind of sent me on a why would he do that kind of thing. I was raised in a pretty conservative Catholic background, and that's kind of led me to learn more about Islam, and then eventually over time, I came to accept it. Now, in the case of Alec, you know, he was inspired by learning about a famous Muslim. Um, he wasn't someone who had received a Quran, and then he started reading it and ended up becoming Muslim. But the reason I introduce you to Yusuf Niles and, and Alec is to emphasize an important point. In, in the case of both of these individuals, um, because I can show you people taking Shahada all day, but what happened to them? Well, all of these people, I still know them today that I'm going to show you in this interview. And Yusuf is involved in Dawah now. Like mm. he contacts me to order Quran to send to prisons. So mm. not only has he accepted Islam, now he's actively going out as a representative of our, of our community to tell others about it. 
In the case of Alec, he actually ends up joining the Muslim Student Association at the local college that he's in and becomes a member of it and a supporter of it. And so he's now joined in the, in the, in the leadership of, you know, uh, a very important part of the university system, which is the one element where Muslims kind of expose themselves on most campuses here in the United States, right. uh, whether they do these wear a hijab day or, you know, even the MSA and the local Muslim orgs have gotten together and done like free Quran give outs. But he ended up getting a Quran um, after he took his Shahada. So it played a part in his, not in his journey to Islam, but in his journey after he became Muslim. Now, these next two stories are utterly amazing to me. Um, and they're amazing to me because they're, they're very unique in, in, in the sense that of the result of them. Uh, a small effort became something really large. So I'll start with this one. This is uh, my friend Yusuf. And this is his story about how he ended up becoming Muslim in a brief. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone. It's your brother Isa Wood with Forkan Project. I'd like to introduce you all today to brother Yusuf Hanif. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. This brother, I met him about four and a half years ago, and you can go to the Forkan Studios YouTube channel to watch the video of him taking his shahada. Ashhadu, ashhadu, Allah, Allah, ilaha, ilaha, illallah, illallah, wa, wa, ashhadu, ashhadu, anna, anna, Muhammadan, Muhammadan, Rasul, Rasul, Allah, Allah. Uh, you said Allah. perfect. Allah. 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 How did you learn about Islam, brother? I heard you got a Quran uh, when well, you were incarcerated one time. Yeah, I was, I was, I was actually going through some tough times at the time, and um, you know, Allah guided me through a situation. I got into a high-speed chase, and He sat me down for a few days, and I wanted a book to read, and no one had a book to read. I asked one person, and he's like, "Well, I don't have a book to read, but I do have the Quran." And it was actually pretty much this one. It was the clear Quran, but it, it was the English translation of the Quran at the time. It had a law written in it. And so I had never read the Quran, so I decided, okay, I'll take it back to my cell and I'll read. And I started reading, and alhamdulillah, Allah opened my eyes. Even the introduction from the Quran, it actually helped me to see some points about the, the why, the why Islam. And so as I continued to read and as I continued to search even more, I got to Surah Al-Fatiha and I read from the first few ayats and I got to guide us to the straight path and then my eyes was open. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been guiding me ever since and I'm thankful for that. MashaAllah, go, go watch his shahada on our Quran Studios page. But the reason I'm introducing you again to him is because, MashaAllah, the last khutbah that I attended myself this was the Imam of the khutbah, mashallah. Four and a half years later, giving a khutbah in perfect Arabic, mashallah, leading us in salah. So here we have Ma someone, you know, they, they obviously got into a situation where they were incarcerated and they had to spend time in solitary confinement, you know, or in quarantine, as it will. And, you know, he, Allah guided him that day to get a copy of the Quran to read, and he had the time to sit and think about it. And, you know, the, the most people in America that end up becoming Muslim are in the prison system because they're forced to be around Muslims every day. They yeah. they have to see Islam being practiced, and, and then the Quran translations being available are just icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look at this brother, you know, he, the Quran inspired him to become Muslim. Now, four and a half years later, he's, he's the, the assistant Imam of the local masjid here, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, you know, this is a, this is a very powerful story about once again, you know, when these people really accept Islam, uh, not just as something they did to get married or some ulterior motive, but this, because they really thought it would benefit their life. Look at what uh, Allah does with them. You know, they become important, pivotal members of our community. Who can benefit us and benefit others and um this last story i'll share with you is probably the most powerful and maybe you'll probably want to spend the most time talking about it but uh this is probably the most unique one of all so this is brother yusuf crenshaw
Okay, so Preston, very simply put, we have called you to worship God alone and follow Muhammad as God's final messenger, and you have agreed to do that. So at this point, you're just going to say that out loud as a testimony of faith, and then you will be our brother in Islam, no longer a brother in So just repeat after me in English. I bear witness, I bear witness that, there is no God that there is no God except Allah. Except Allah. And, and I bear witness, I bear witness that, Muhammad, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, peace be upon him is God's messenger. Is God's messenger. So okay. now we're going to... I have him additionally say it in Arabic too. Um, but why am I playing you this video? Well, now this is a very, very interesting story here. So this brother came to our Meet Your Muslim Neighbor tour and he, you know, just basically came on the invitation of a coworker to just do the tour. Right. And subhanAllah, you know, most of the time I, I don't go into these tours like I'm trying to convert people to Islam. Like I've never had that mentality in my dawah. I'm just trying to introduce them to it and then give them some materials and be a person available to them if they want to continue that journey. I don't, I don't consider myself a missionary or anything like that. Um, but in this case, this was one of those interesting situations where someone came to our tour and on the same day were ready to become Muslim. I mean, mm -hmm. it was like subhanAllah, amazing. He walked up to me at the end of the tour and he said, you know, very clearly, um, you know, I think Islam is what I need to be doing with my life. And so, you know, right there on the spot, you know, we, we picked up the cell phone camera and then we uh, basically gave him his shahada. Now, after we gave him his shahada, he actually spent, uh, I got to know him a little better, and he confessed to me that he was actually homosexual. Mm -hmm. And that not only was he homosexual, but he was a cross-dresser. I mean, he was dressing like a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of tell from the video, he has like really long, lanky, uh, really long straight hair, and he um, is has kind of a feminine voice. Well, lo and behold, um, I left that city that I was doing this program in, and subhanAllah, when I came back, Yusuf walked up to me, and he said, you know, would you like to see a picture of my wedding? And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm married. And I'm thinking to myself, like, wait, didn't this guy just tell me two years ago that he was homosexual. You know, I, I didn't, I, you know, when, when he told me that, I never gave him a hard time about it or anything. I just uh, told him, you know, well, just don't worry about that right now. Just learn to practice Islam and all that good stuff. But he, you know, went on to tell me very clearly that, you know, he developed heterosexual feelings after two years. Oh, and time. from practicing Islam and lowering his gaze and not looking at other people as objects, and subhanAllah, he said it eventually just caused him to want to ha have a relationship with a woman. And uh, let me share my screen real quick. I'll show you uh, Yusuf at his wedding. So you can see um, the result. Uh, let me see, share screen. There we go. Photos. So this is Yusuf today. Totally different looking person. Mashallah, mashallah. Um, all the colors back in his face, you know, I mean, because he was living a very wild lifestyle, you know. I mean, he was deep in the homosexual lifestyle. And that's his wife. You know, they're married today. I just went to their house the other day, did an interview with him. It'll be on our Forcon Studios uh, site maybe within the next week. But um, this story is just utterly amazing because it, it really flies in the face of the uh, – a common misconception today that people are born this way hmm. and that they have no choice in the matter. Um, when this hell happened, I ended up contacting my um, former college professor in psychology, Dr. Ash, uh -huh. um, because I remember having a conversation with him about this and uh, he sent me this uh, reply in the email, which is um, to summarize it. And this is how I believe I teach, uh, I, I, uh, this is what I now believe and teach, is that 100% of my lesbian clients, friends, students, and colleagues 
who I knew their personal history had been sexually abused. Though I understand the research ranges from 50 to 90%. However, this is in marked contrast to one in six heterosexuals who have had sexual abuse histories. Mm. You know, I, I, this is something I really, I try to point out to a lot of the people in the Muslim community who don't understand homosexuality is that we can say pretty confidently in the case of, of uh, homosexual women, that it's, it's the very high probability that something happened to them when they were children, they were sexually abused, and that led them to have a misinformed uh, sexual experience growing up. Um, in the case of a lot of women, it was a man who abused them, and so they began to fear men, and they began to see women as like a secure place to go to, and so they allow themselves to you know, start developing sexual feelings for women. Now notice he also says, second, it has been my experience that male homosexuals either also, meaning also fall into this category of having been sexually abused, had sexual abuse as a child or had poor relationships with their fathers who had, had been either neglectful or authoritarian, both strong relationships, uh, but strong relationships with their mother who had either been manipulative with their husbands if he was authoritarian or had been themselves obviously strong and authoritarian if the father was weak. Okay. And then he sent me some articles, um, which I can show you, uh, that confirm his basic premises, which is um, a massive study confirms uh, no one has a gay gene. You know, and this was done on... Uh, I forgot he said maybe close to a, this is a uh, researchers at the Broad Institute uh, analyzed the genomes from nearly half a million people to better understand if and how genetic role play, uh, genetics play a role in sexual orientation. And of course, the answer is genetics can't predict whether a person will engage in same sex behavior. Um, he also sent me this study from um, John Hopkins, I believe. Yeah. Hopkins, yeah. So John Hopkins, uh, psychiatrist, there is no gay gene. Uh, in other words, this is something that a person can choose. Okay. Now it doesn't mean that they are not being tested by a law. Like everyone is tested with a certain amount of inclination towards certain types of sin, right? It may be that you are not tested with homosexuality, but you're tested with promiscuity, right? You want to have all these relationships outside of marriage, and that's your test in life. Or you're a person who can't stop stealing, or you're a person who can't stop backbiting, right? But not everyone has the same tests in life. So it, it doesn't mean that a person who, who formerly had homosexual feelings can't eventually get to a point where they... Um, can feel attraction again to the opposite gender that the, the former homosexual feelings are just going to go away forever. That may be the case, may not be the case, but it doesn't mean that they're stuck in homosexuality. Like they have no way to, to get out of it, that, that they can't develop feelings towards the uh, opposite um, sex. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, um, these are, these are the stories I want to emphasize um, because I want to be clear to the Muslim community today that's watching this that, you know, imagine you're a person today and you have tons of food, like more food than you can ever eat. And you're eating, you know, every day to your fill of the most delicious food in the world. And you're living in a place where everyone is starving, mm -hmm. literally starving around you. They don't, they don't have anything. And you have more food than you need. In fact, it's unlimited what you have. Why are you not giving it to them? Why do you keep it to yourself? What kind of person are you if you don't share it with them? And that's the thing I, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize to people is that, you know, Islam is not just some religion you join, you get a new hat, you change your name to Muhammad, and, and now you feel like you're part of a, another team. It's actually helping people. It's changing their lives. It's improving their condition. It's making them better. I can say that personally for myself. And the same applies to anyone born and raised as a Muslim. There, there will come a point in your life that have, if it hasn't already, and you should ask Allah that, it, that this point comes, where you start to say, am I a Muslim because I really want to be? Or I'm a Muslim because 
I'm in an environment full of Muslims or mom and dad were Muslim or whatever. Because when that moment comes in your life, then you'll start to practice Islam sincerely. And then you'll see the benefits of it. And that's the whole point is that we're trying to give benefit to people. That's, that's the, the premise behind our faith. And this is not about going out to people who, who already find comfort in whatever they're doing. It's the millions and millions and millions of people out there who are not satisfied with their way of life. You know, I, I don't go out there trying to change Christians to Muslims and Jews to Muslims and Buddhists to Muslims. You know, if you're in your faith and you're already happy with it, you know, then, then I, I've got nothing to offer you. you. You seem to be content. But what I'm finding is that the overwhelming majority of people are not content with what they have. And I, I am content with what I have. I know tons of people who are, and why am I not at least sharing it with you? And that's always been kind of my mentality with Dawah, not the missionary evangelical Islamic Dawah that we see so often today, but the, but the kind of like, look, we have something great. We should, we should at least try to share it with people and let them decide what they want to do. Um, but these are, these are, I hope, inspiring stories. Absolutely. Um, I think now, they're, you know, the, the fact that, um, I think the number one thing everyone can do is to be bold about the fact I'm Muslim. And then the second thing you can do is at least share a copy of the Quran, right? Um, otherwise, what is the meaning? There's no meaningfulness in that and no sincerity in that friendship. Meaning, you know, you have Islam, you have the truth and you're not even able to, or you're too embarrassed to, you know, they say in the purification of the heart, the most basic quality is, is courage. Uh, without courage, you really can't do a lot of other things. And so you need to have that courage. You need to develop and, and ask yourself, am I embarrassed that I'm Muslim? Or am I embarrassed to share the Quran? Because Quran will change the lives of millions and millions of people if it gets into their, into their mind, into their reading. I sincerely believe that anyone who opens up the Quran and begins to read it with an open mind. In fact, I know one brother who, um, in, in, in Chicago, I know one brother who became Muslim. He, he opened up the Quran with the intent of finding fault in it and still became Muslim because ultimately his heart was in a good place. You know, the Quran says, you live your bihi kathira wa yahdi bihi kathira. Allah guides many with Quran and leads many astray with Quran. But the prophetic model of da'wah, the prophetic uh, the, the prophetic model of da'wah is doing da'wah through the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is very clear about this. You know, بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ O Prophet, convey which has been sent to you. And if you do not, you've not conveyed the message. Meaning, sometimes we try to convey the message of Islam in other ways, that's fine. But the primary way should be introduce them to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, you'll find that uh, when they open the Book of Allah, that it will open their hearts too, inshallah. Well, um, at, this, uh, at this point, I'd actually like to ap appeal to your audience uh, for an easy way to do that. And um, so I'm just going to briefly share with you all. Uh, Sheikh Omar and me, uh, Sheikh Omar is a former employee, but I'm currently uh, working with them, uh, work with the organization that you saw today. Um, every single one of these people we mentioned are a recipient of, and that is Orkan Project. Yep. Um, we are the largest distributor of Quran translations in the United States and Canada. Um, we also distribute through IERA in Britain, um, in which IERA is a worldwide organization. So they also distribute the Quran translation we print throughout the entire world. But the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that, you know, you have a couple of options here to do something really good today. And especially in the month of the Quran, you know, what, what does Allah say about this month, Shaykh Omar? A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Shahru Ramadan Alladheena unzila Fihi al-Qur'an Hudal linnas Wa bayinati min al-huda Wal furqan Ila akhir al-ayah So this is the month that Allah revealed the Qur'an as a guidance for all of humanity, not for Muslims for everybody and to help them understand the difference between right and wrong you know, and Forcon Project facilitates a way for everyone to get involved with that. So you can go today to the Forcon Project website and you can click on donate here in the upper right hand corner. And what you're actually clicking on is a link 
to allow yourself to sponsor Quran translations. You can go and sponsor, for example, an entire box of Quran for $104. That's 52 translations that we will give out on your behalf. And there's plenty of options here. Uh, you can do one of these pre-populated options or you can type in your own amount. Every $2 you give is like sponsoring one copy. And you can also do something even better. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said the consistent deeds are the better ones, not the one-time thing. You can become a monthly donor. You know, for example, if you give, um, become like a 10 bucks a year donor over, over a monthly donation, that would be the equivalent of like $2.87 a day towards this project for a year. By the end of the year, you've done over 520, or around 520 Qurans, the 10 boxes we've given out on your behalf to prisons, hospitals, dorm rooms all over the country. And that's like, what, a cup of coffee a day? Except instead of a cup of coffee, which is not going to come testify you for you on the day of judgment, you know, that cup of coffee is not going to help you. Uh, but the Quran is an intercessor. You know, it comes on the day of judgment and like begs Allah and certain... Especially in the month of Ramadan, the Prophet mentioned as an intercessor specifically, Al-Quran was Sayyamu Yashfa'an. Quran and fasting will intercede for us. Right. They're going to they're gonna assist you on the day of judgment. Now, imagine you cared enough about Allah's book to make sure that someone had a free copy of it every day for a year or two years or 10 years or whatever. You know, that, that, that has way more benefit for me on the day of judgment than, than my cup of coffee every day. And that doesn't mean you have to give up your cup of coffee. You can still have your cup of coffee and give out a Quran every day, just depending on your situation. Yeah. But the point is, is this a very easy way to, to just invest your, your, you know, money in something and it does the work for you. Like we take care of the distribution and I know where all of these go because I've established partnerships uh, with Dawa organizations all over the country to give them copies of the Quran to give out through their program. You know, our, our main thing is just printing and distributing, but it's the organizations and the masajid who do the groundwork of giving them to people and just establishing the relationships. Now, other than that, um, uh, donating is the best thing you can do uh, because we intend to print about 500,000 copies of this. So we're trying to raise a little bit over a million dollars to, to print another 500,000. <clears> By the way, we're still working even during this lockdown, uh, sending out Quran. But you can go to this website. It's called sendaquran.com. And you can actually type in an address or a phone number, uh, an address of someone that you'd like it to go to. And we'll actually send a free Quran out for you. Just click on one of the copies that has a zero price tag. Like you have the Spanish translation here. Uh, you have the English translation here. And these will be sent out um, for free. All, you're, all you end up paying is the shipping and handling. And we also have a, uh, uh, when the slide gets back, let's see if it'll switch real quick. You can send um, brochures as well. If you just want to send someone a brochure about Islam, we have those as well. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, uh, give whatever you can. You know, I mean, this is, this is, you know, the only thing the Prophet ﷺ did extra in this month was charity. He didn't pray any extra. You know, he, he was already consistently fasting. Obviously, you have to fast the whole month of Ramadan, but he was already fasting large portions of many months of the year anyway. And, you know, he, but he did increase in his, his charity, his sadaqah. And, and that, that just goes to show you that this is really not a month about you and me, right? It's a month about other people around us and yeah. how, how we can affect them. And it's just as much a charity to give food to a needy person as it is guidance. It's like they, we used to say when I was Christian, you know, you can give a man a fish or you can teach him to fish, yeah. right? Which one of these options is better? I mean, I can feed needy people but I can also give them guidance. And through that guidance, they can, they can submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they can become people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can rain down from the heavens uh, the, all the provision they need, right? But they have to give up their sinful lifestyle. They have to make tawbah and they have to make sincere tawbah and with, with tawheed, you know, to the, to the one and only true God, Allah azza wa jal. So the, and that's, that's really the other main story about all these different uh, individuals I mentioned today who took Shahada is they all made Toba from their lifestyle. And they said, you know what, whatever I was doing before wasn't working and I'm done with it. And Toba is such an important thing because if you don't make Toba, 
you can still start doing good things, but they don't have the impact on you that um, it would if you left off the sins. And in the case of like Yusuf, you know, he left that homosexual lifestyle completely and the cross dressing and everything. And he said, I'm done with that. And, you know, then Allah changed his heart. But you can't persist in your sin and expect Allah to change your, your heart. Allah doesn't change uh, the condition of a people until they change what's in themselves. Mm-hmm. And Allahu Alam, this is talking about Toba. You know, um, it yeah, could also I mean, mean it other always things. always begins with Toba. In fact, intention is a form of Toba. I mean, the, you know, Imam Nawi in his Riyadh Salihin starts with the chapter of in- intention, but the next chapter is Toba. But what is Toba? Toba is uh re uh, adjusting your intention uh and turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making that your intention so again uh i want to emphasize that uh, uh imam isa and me we both uh imam isa is currently working with furqan foundation i was with furqan foundation for 7 years uh in when it was first uh starting and so this is an organization that we both uh have some experience with and so, uh, you know, definitely go to the website and in this month, in this month of Quran, share the Quran and, uh, and uh, inshallah ta'ala, Allah will reward you, especially with the difficult times maybe ahead of us. If you spend now, Allah will take care of you when things really become difficult. Well, you actually bring up a good point there. And I thought about this the other day, you know, um, uh, at the end of Surah Al-Araf, I believe, there's the story about the town by the sea that was tested on the Sabbath. Yeah. And, you know, uh, they were told not to work on the Sabbath. And then the, uh, on, the fish would not come for the fishermen to catch except on the Sabbath. So they thought to themselves, okay, well, we'll just throw our nets out the day before the Sabbath starts. And then the fish will get caught in the net. And then the day after the Sabbath, we'll go collect the fish. So they thought they would trick Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and you know, the, the deeper meaning behind this is leaving the law really, but the apparent meaning here, uh, what, what I'm telling the story for is that you have this conversation between a group of the people who are not engaged in the sin and the ones who are advising the sinners. And they're like, why do you even bother to advise these people? Like, they're just going to get punished by a law anyway. Like, you know, and they say, you know, well, we hope that through our advice to them, like Allah will spare us. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, think to yourself, you know, look, you're in a place where homosexuals are getting married, right, for the first time in history. People are openly consuming intoxicants. People are pornography addicts, you know, watching other people commit zina on their smartphones multiple times a day all over. You know, I mean, the the amount of sin today in the world is, is unbelievable, um, and at any moment, Allah can just enact judgment on, on any of these places. Yeah. Uh, but he, he is going to take note of the people who were at least trying to tell people the truth, trying to give advice, trying to, to rectify the situation. And those people can be saved. And he always saves the people who are giving advice. Every one of these prophets and their people who were, were, were sent you know, they keep telling their people all the way up until the last minute. And then Allah gives them some way out, you know, where they're saved and the people who didn't take the advice uh, receive the punishment. And so at the very least, we should, we should look at it that way. Like, you know, even if we feel like there's no hope for a lot of people today that they're just not going to listen. Well, they didn't listen to the prophet Muhammad. They didn't listen to Jesus. They didn't listen to Moses, peace be upon them. But yeah, that didn't... reminds me, you know, one of the interpretations of the ayah, Maliki Yawmiddin, is not just that there is a day of judgment after this life, but there's tilka ayyamullah. There's the days, of, sometimes Allah enacts judgment in this life. So there's like a smaller qiyamah, you could say, against you. Uh, in, you have to pay back your debt in this life, and then of course you have to in the next life. But it's, it's not limited to, oh, you're free to do whatever you want in this life, and there'll be absolutely no no consequences in this life and you're only going to get the consequences in the next life and who knows that if the next life is coming or not it's not like that there is yomuddin sometimes even in this life and it happened with the with the people that the prophets were sent to and 
you know, sometimes it happens in a person's life, like the man in the garden, in Shunkahab, right? He had his garden and it was gone. And so it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can enact or execute his judgment. Uh, and he does execute his judgment, especially at the collective level. Especially at the collective level, meaning we're judged for our deeds at the collective level for sure, 100% in this life. But we're judged for our individual deeds in the next life. That's the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says, fitnatan. Fear that fitna. Because when the wrongdoers, when the fitna comes to, when the punishment comes to the wrongdoers because of the fitnas, then the good and the bad get hurt. Except, the only exception is the people that tried to stop them from doing the wrong. Like the hadith of the Prophet, where the Prophet talks about the people in the ship, right? Um, so, you know, somebody's putting a hole in the ship. And, and this ship, let's say the West or America or whatever, our society, uh, people are putting so many holes in it and we're all in the same ship. You know, whether it is pornography, whether it is alcohol, whether it is drugs, whether it is uh, these other alternative lifestyles that are, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is, the ship, we're all in the same ship collectively. And if we're not going to stop them, then we're all going to sink. And that will be our judgment on this life before the and then you're punished also in the next life and that's the tragedy of life that you know this life is difficult and then you have to face the consequences in this life and the next life well not only that um and this is to really look at it from a very positive perspective is that you know every single one of these people that you share a quran with you share a brochure with you talk to about islam they have to come on the day of judgment and testify for you and you're in your you know, singular court case with a law where you have to stand in front of God and you have to deal with what you did in your life, the, the witnesses will come, people who will come and testify on you or, or against you. And all of these people have to come. Whether they became Muslim or not is not my concern. Uh, Allahu yahdi may yasha. Allah, Allah guides whomever he wants and Allah guides whomever wants to be guided, right? Both meanings are true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the one is a theological meaning, meaning Allah's power over everything, and the other one is about our our own volition. But the the point is that you know these people have to at least say that you know you you did your duty uh, to, to to convey to them the message. And then Allah either guided them or He didn't. They either wanted guidance or they didn't. Uh, not that shouldn't be your concern. And that that's the really the good news I think about Tao in general. Like we don't have to change people's hearts. That is not our concern, you know. That's Allah's duty to, to guide people, to change their hearts, to, to open them. It's just your duty to tell people. And th yes, of course, most of them are going to reject it. That's not the point. The point is not how many success stories you have. The point is that you're trying. And that at the same time, you're not driving people away from Islam, right? Because we can get involved in da'wah the wrong way with the wrong intention, which is that I just want to win arguments. Right. I want to get in a debate with everybody I meet and crush their theological ideas just so I can beat my chest like an ape and, and make everybody feel like Islam is so much greater than everything else. That should not be your intention at all. You know, your intention should be to actually help improve people's lives and, and, and that, that, that this guidance will, will help them. And it's not about you. You know, remove your ego from the situation. Like, who, who cares whether you're right or wrong or whether you win an argument? That's not the point. The truth is the truth. If you didn't convey it properly, that didn't mean it wasn't true. If they didn't accept it, it doesn't make it not the truth. So, um, inshallah, I'll, I'll uh, send a link to uh, Sheikh Omar to put in the description. So, anyone yeah. who wants to donate, anyone who wants to send a Quran, um, and, you know, do, do your best in this month to try to do something good for the sake of Allah. And if you're a non-Muslim and you're watching this today and you want a free copy, we can send you one very easily. You can email us through the um, uh, Forcon Project website and we can send you a free copy, uh, no charge whatsoever. Or if you just want to bypass talking to us and get one for free, you can go to sendalquran.com, send it to yourself and you just end up paying the shipping and handling. But we just tell people, open it up and read it. You know, it's not going to hurt you. It doesn't mean you have to become a Muslim. And right. maybe you won't become a Muslim. That's not my, my issue. My point is that at least you'll know. At least you'll know what it says, right? And you'll 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 understand uh, at least what Muslims believe and where we get our beliefs from, and why one fifth of the entire world believes that, you know, this message is true. 
um, you'll have a greater understanding of your, your fellow human being at the very least, and it won't hurt you at all. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Uh, I think it was another good uh, uh, discussion we had, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, help the Ummah come out of Ramadan stronger. And uh, I hope, inshallah, all of you who can afford will definitely go to the website and um, and put your heart into it and send the Quran to your masjid even so that it can be distributed or to your house, get a box so it can be distributed. Trust me, the more Qurans we get into the hands of the people and the more people that read the Quran, it's, it's the more we will alleviate the anger of Allah uh, on this ummah right now. And the more we will be in a position to ask Allah for help. Not only that, but uh, I'll, we'll just leave with this uh, dua. The Prophet Islam used to actually make dua for non-Muslims and Muslims as well. The same exact dua. He used to say, "Yahdikum Allahu wa yuslihu balakum." You know, may Allah subhanahu wa taala give you guidance, and may He rectify your matters. And and that's that's that dua is for everybody. Right. You know, everybody, everybody, Muslim, non-Muslim. No one, no one should have a problem with that supplication whatsoever. You know, we, we all want everyone to receive guidance from the creator. And um, I hope you all do your best to try to play a part in that role. So, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh Omar, for having me today. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika. Wa na shadu wa da ilahi da anta wa na stagfiruka wa na tubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.